together for almost a decade. Um, Don't say that. Is that true? I'm not going to count. <laughs> God. Time. What is time? A long time. Mm-hmm. time. <laughs> uh, a lot of conversations about exes, you know, <laughs> a lot of years. To, but um, but maybe the thinking about it in terms of precarity and possibility is also one of the reasons it takes a long time to do this kind of work in the way that we've been trying to do it. This I work on the People's Guide, um, a social justice tour guide of New Orleans, part of the series from University of California Press. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about that project and the the process of doing that that project together over the years. I am Linnell Thomas, a professor of American Studies at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Congratulations, professor. <laughs> professor. Um, it's just exciting still. Um, and I'm Elizabeth Stebe. I'm an assistant professor in the language and literature department uh, at the University of New Orleans here in New Orleans and have been co-editing, co-writing this book with Linnell for the last few years. We'll just say a few years. Let's just say that. <laughs> that sounds um, good. Yeah. Um, I think we wanted, to, we're obviously having a conversation with each other, but um, wanting to be mindful of our audience and um, and introduce people to things and maybe also jog some things that are um, that give us some insights about sort of revisiting um, some of the nuts and bolts of this project. So we wanted to share a couple of just slides and visuals um, with folks to give you an introduction to the project. So I will do that now. Maybe Linnell, you want to start talking about what we're working on? Right. And this conversation that we're having today is one that we, I can't say began at the conference this past year, but um, that w- there was one iteration of it at the, the conference. So we'll talk a little bit about that. In thinking about the, the conference theme, you know, focusing on possibility and precarity, and in some ways that sort of is New Orleans or even like sometimes I think about it I was telling Stevie more like impossibility like people trying to make something possible out of this place that doesn't even seem like it should be able to exist and persist and you know particularly thinking about the black folks that have been here like the impossibility of Black existence and survival and resistance historically in this place. This, um, looking at this this photograph of the Claiborne underpass under the bridge, like people say, this area in New Orleans was part of Black Main Street, as it was called in the you know 1960s and before early 1960s and before it's where black people congregated for black Mardi Gras and black people weren't even allowed to be in the French Quarter and on Canal Street but it was a, a beautiful neutral ground with these hundred year old oak trees and all of that was torn down to construct this overpass leading people into the white suburbs of New Orleans and displacing about 178 families in the process and businesses and um, benevolent organizations and their meeting places and all of these places where culture germinated and really created the reasons that tourists continue to come to the to the city. And yet, um, so. Th- This uh, was constructed between 1966 and 1968. 
And even though the it really caused great harm to the neighborhoods, people continue to return. The, the artwork on these columns is one version of that, or artists have come in to document the, the history of the, the neighborhood with different types of cultural forms and people that have been important in the, the community. Also, it's a place where second lines continue to congregate and brass bands and the acoustics are, are really good. So even this place that did great damage to the community and brought in pollution really disrupted the neighborhood, um, took away businesses. Um, there's still ways that, that people have made use and repurposed this, this space and sustained the culture in new ways. And I think in a lot of ways, our book project and or the different versions of a people's guide that we imagine give voice to, to that kind of experience in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. These efforts at recuperation and resistance and uh, revitalization and resilience throughout the city's history. And I do just love how there's such a variety of different kinds of things that are paid homage to in the images. Like you, you see the the trees um, that used to line the street, and then there's the painting of the tree on one of the pillars that that remembers those trees, um, and just various people who've um, made an impact, um, both the city, the region, um, perhaps even globally. Just remembered um, in the the artists who planted the, the columns here. Okay. Um, so this is a, a map that gives you a little bit of an overview of how the guide is create has created, we as editors of the guide have created different neighborhoods that are grouping together different parts of the city that are often not grouped together, um, not considered because of phenomenon like redlining and um, white supremacist segregationist tactics, different types of housing development. And so you can see from the different colors that we have here, some of the neighborhoods, the different neighborhoods that we've grouped together in the guide and are creating relationships that it, asking people to imagine relationships between these neighborhoods that are often seen as vastly separated for various reasons and not to discount those those differences between the neighborhoods, but to, again, to speak to their interrelatedness, no matter what people might want to deny. Um, so creating neighborhoods like the Gentilly Lakeview New Orleans East neighborhood, for example, Lakeview being a vastly predominantly white suburb that was created in the wake of white flight in the city. Um, and linking it to um, neighborhoods that have had historic black populations and homeowners and lots of variety of cross that, that development in Gentilly New Orleans East, but in terms of um, the sort of way they operate in the public imagination today. Um, so that's sort of an example. And we've also got mid, mid city neighborhoods like the Garden District, Central City and Uptown, the French Quarter in Algiers, which links um, the East Bank of the river with the West Bank and creating a kind of a imagined geography there. And all of this is working beyond the tourist zones that are typically the areas of the city that people are encouraged to move around, to travel around, to sightsee. And so thinking about our project as one that is asking people to are encouraging people and teaching people about different areas of the city that they might not otherwise encounter in some of the, the more popular tours that people do, or just in the ways in which things like the um, Chamber of Commerce might like encourage people to, to explore the city. And so having them, encouraging them to go visit sites that are along the lake um, of Lake Pontchartrain, for example, as opposed to just clustered around the river in the French Quarter where people are pr probably most commonly um, gonna be experiencing what they consider to be the history of the city or a kind of an authentic or real um, old-timey <laughs> um, New Orleans. And 
Um, yeah, so our, we have sites that are that are located all across this kind of very broad geography of what actually entails the city of New Orleans and the boundaries of Orleans Parish. Yeah, and I think to add to that, Stevie, we're looking at the the areas that force disrupt the tourist geography of the city to move out of the the tourist zones. And you can go back to that slide because and rethinking, or I'm into the to the next one, rethinking about even those neighborhoods that tourists think they know and the sites that they know either reinterpreting them and giving um, alternative histories that, that go beyond the tourist interpretation. So that next slide that you were showing with Leon Waters, who is on our advisory board, and that's been another thing that's been really important about the project to, you know, we are working on it together, but we're working in collaboration or in partnership with a, a lot of folks. And Leon Waters um, has done a lot of things in New Orleans. He was part of the group in the 1990s that um, um, created the, the ordinance to rename public schools that have been named after slave owners. And, you know, a lot of young people who are part of Take Them Down, NOLA, um, who helped to remove those Confederate honoring uh, monuments in the city, were working with him and indebted to, to that hi history. So seeing the, the layers of these, these histories and layers of histories of resistance in New Orleans. So one of the areas that's in the tourist zone, the Cabildo that tourists see all the time, we retell that story, or Leon Waters does in an entry on the Cabildo that focuses on the 1811 uh, slave uprising, the largest in the United States that started in St. James Parish with uh, Charles Delonde, um, an enslaved person of the Delonde family who had been refugees after the Haitian Revolution. So looking at these regional and international influences and situated in New Orleans and that, and how that revolution influenced maybe up to 500 enslaved people who took to the River Road, trying to make it to the Cabildo to, to take over the city and, and trying to make New Orleans uh, a place for enslaved people throughout the country to, to come and resist slavery by any means necessary. And they weren't successful in that endeavor, but it certainly didn't end the, the desire and the will of people in the city to combat um, slavery and its legacy um, going forward. Yeah, and I'm also just thinking about um, Mr. Leon's book that he wrote about the uprising and work to get published himself and was not working in like traditional academic networks very deliberately I think very intentionally um, but just like what a passion project this was for him for so long and thinking about that being the case with so many people who were trying to uplift in this book um, who for many years like you know just talking about the organizing they did in the 90s but thinking about just the kind of counter history counter memory that people have produced for themselves and very kind of what I would think of as DIY just community-based grassroots um, ways of publishing circulating information um, and we see that you know certainly continuing into the 21st century today um, we're thinking about the some of them, some, that's something I think we'll talk about later, but thinking about digital media and thinking about Mr. Leon as kind of this, um, in this genealogy of people who are using print media, in his case, to produce a counter memory. And it, yeah. how hard that is to do, just the sort of like precarity of that model, but also the enduring legacy of it. Yeah, and I mean, you use genealogy, I, I forgot to mention that that was so much a part of his history because it was through the family stories and oral history that he learned about this uprising. He didn't encounter it as most people don't through, you know, official histories of the 
the region or, or even the country. So part of that work has been tracing his own genealogy and you know, speaking of innovative ways, because it's not just the book, but he's also part of doing like the reenactments of conducting his own tours of the, the uprising. And he's also done a lot of work with public schools. So multiple audiences and multiple ways to, to tell the story beyond the, you know, certainly beyond academic, but beyond just the, the print media too. Yeah. And thinking just about the people who've been inspired by the work that he's done to create their own memories of the 1811 uprising. I've seen plays that were based on it. There have been large scale filmed reenactments of it um, that have all happened in the last five to 10 years. And it's hard to imagine really that those things would have happened at least in the same way that they did um, or in the same timeline without um, Leon Waters' work um, being, you know, setting a kind of a foundation for a next generation of people who are trying to remember the uprising in, in ways that I think can energize contemporary um, Black resistance struggles, um, Black and Indigenous resistance struggles. Um, yeah. Is there anything else about this, this site, Linnell, that you're thinking about in terms of how it is either representative of, of the work we're doing or, or any questions that come up for you about how we're telling these stories or <laughs> uh, how our book is is part of this i i feel like you asked me a question did you have something in mind <laughs> <laughs> what else might be <laughs> what might i be thinking about stevie I don't know. I don't know. I'm just just kind of curious. Um, I mean, I, I guess part of it for me is um, is like I think that's the challenge for us in general is you know that people will go to this you know to the Cabildo site, I, perhaps ideally as they are reading our book, and then read this story, and but there's nothing around this place that marks what happened and our book is and is working as a kind of marker and people like Leon Waters have fought to have other kinds of historical markers right. put up in the city for example markers to the transatlantic slave trade that are now uh, put up all along the the riverfront um at what's known as the moonwalk in the French Quarter and and in Algiers um, on the West Bank and along Esplanade Avenue as well um, but there's nothing, as far as I know of, not yet, um, for 1811. Um, so I guess I just, you know, I'm I'm already thinking like, how do we, how do we kind of, how how are we through the stories we're trying to tell, kind of animate that place in a different way? But also thinking about like the images of what happened here at the Cabildo are just truly horrifying. It's it's right. horrible to imagine it. You know, the the level of violence, the kind of spectacle right. of violence that was created in the, the right. of the people who rebelled um yeah so and I that too yeah I mean I didn't mention that but since you referenced it the you know the people that were captured maybe up to a hundred there were three different tribunals and most were sent back to plantations to be executed by firing squad but some were horribly tortured and killed including Charles Delon who was um, you know, decapitated and his limbs cut off. And he was, I think, set on fire as well. But the who the people who were identified as leaders were decapitated and their heads staked along the route to, to River Road as an example to anybody else who might be thinking about um, escaping or rebelling and as a message. And it also prompted other slave owners throughout the the region to um, be much more brutal in their, you know, enforcement of, of slavery. So, you know, it, thinking about those kinds of, of markers too, you know, makes me think about some of the other kinds of work that we're doing. Like one of the things that, that Stevie and I are doing you know, are, we're leading a workshop later this summer for Friends of the Cabildo that conducts um, walking tours of the, the city. And I think a lot of our work 
has not just been about writing entries or um, you know, even working with, with partners, but cultivating these kinds of relationships so that it's not just about the people who have contact with the, the book when it comes out, but that we are making some imprint across the, the city for all the folks who are engaged with narrating the, the histories of, of New Orleans. And that we are you know, part of, as you mentioned, a, a, a lot, a group of people that are doing this in a lot of different ways that, you know, some that we have partnered with more officially, but, but also in informal ways and just through networks of support and the efforts that, that we're all doing in the city. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that feels like so much of what we're doing in this project is like giving people an introduction and ourselves, perhaps even the book is an introduction to, you know, wait, what may be other iterations of people's in the spirit of people's guide or in the direct, um, under the direct umbrella of people's guide, but as ways to comprehend this history, as ways to account for it, as ways to honor the dead, to honor the, the work um, of people who have been engaged in so many different forms of resistance historically, and then just been erased, forgotten. Um, and having, you know, various kind of versions of these places sanitized and, you know, remade in what's ultimately an ongoing neo-colonial tourist project. And, you know, presenting New Orleans is exceptional to all of the racism and violence in other parts of the region and country in the world. And to, you know, as one of our, we've already talked about the ways that New Orleans was representative and important and interrelated with developments um, regionally, nationally, transnationally. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I've been thinking about too is just how is our book in dialogue with and participating in contemporary abolitionist movements, thinking about 1811 as a, as a 19th century abolitionist um, uprising and um, thinking about the work of people like Jackie Summel, who partnered with um, her longtime interlocutor um, and friend and political comrade, Herman Wallace, who was um, incarcerated in solitary confinement for most of his time at um, Angola Penitentiary in Louisiana for over four decades and who um, was released only to sadly pass away a few days later um, from the health conditions that he incurred as a result of having been tortured and, um, and incarcerated for, for, that, for that long, long um, in those conditions. And thinking about the, the project though that Jackie developed out of their relationship, which was about asking, was built on this kind of provocation of asking Herman, um, what did his dream house look like? while he was um, incarcerated in solitary confinement. And one of the things he described as part of his dream house were elaborate gardens. Um, he also imagined a swimming pool, a giant swimming pool that had a tiled Black Panther in the bottom of the pool. And that has not yet come to fruition, but I actually do not, would not be surprised if there's a Black Panther um, designed an inspired pool at some point. But um, so Jackie was like in the spirit of what Herman wanted for his dream house to create these gardens, which exist currently actually all over the US, but uh, the sort of original and sort of anchor solitary gardens project is in the lower ninth ward in a garden space that is, that is curated by and maintained by community volunteers and partners who partner with people who are currently confined in solitary confinement in some part of the United States. And so partly what they do, then the incarcerated person say, it says, here's what I would like to grow. Here's what, and here's how I would like for the plants to be used. And they partner with community partners who help, who help grow that food, which is one of the things Jackie has noticed is that so many people wanted to have the plants be medicinal um, and to be used toward making tinctures and healing tonics and all kinds of things. So lots of use of herbs and plants that are that have like indigenous 
long-term applications and various healing mechanisms. So that's kind of led to her contemporary iteration of this project, which is called Prison Apothecary, which travels around with the tincture, tinctures and things that they've made from these gardens. So really thinking about this as a memory project as well. And so this is a site in the People's Guide that has the express intent of trying to end solitary confinement and in our in our lifetime in the near future and having that be tied to a larger project of imagining a landscape without prisons, imagining a world without prisons in general. And the, the garden beds are in the shape of solitary confinement cells so that the people who visit have can kind of you know, have a way to imagine spatially what it's like to be in such a small space, but also imagining that that person's spirit can never be fully defined by that experience by any means. And so thinking about plant life. And so Jackie's done various iterations of these beds where they actually are made of materials that were historically produced in plantation economies. And then those materials would break down over time. So thinking about that as both a material and a symbolic kind of metaphor for the breaking down of the walls of the prisons themselves and thinking about the works that the work that plants and people together can do to like challenge these kinds of built infrastructures of torture and confinement. And um, so I mean, I think that's, this is one where, you know, one of the sites where it's active, it's contemporary, you know, people who read our book could go there and perhaps might meet some of these volunteers, might meet Jackie, we'll see portraits of Herman. And I know that's something we've kind of been striving for is a kind of a balance of places that people could experience something that is in a kind of ongoing legacy of activist work and other places where they'll they'll be present in the location where something, perhaps many things significant <laughs> happened. Um, but we're highlighting maybe one particular event that's like, you know, teachers going on strike and having a um, a particular protest here, or um, you know, a a place where musicians were playing and then were sanctioned in some ways for their playing, and then challenging these music ordinances, all kinds of things that we've got um, happening in different places, but where the people who we are directing, you know, contemporary uh, people who are experiencing the guide may not see a trace in there, sort of the, the visual landscape. Um, so I think that's sort of a, an ongoing question we've had too, is how do you kind of animate um, and just how do you kind of in a, give people a sensation of what has happened here, and, but where there may not be those kind of visual markers of it, but this is a space right. where people might actually decide they might want to volunteer <laughs> at right. Solitary Gardens or host a Solitary Garden bed in their home place. And so that's part of the kind of, I'd say, the transhistorical project of the People's Guide. And Jackie's an herbalist, right? She has become I've, one. I've had, yeah, I've had a, some tinctures. I didn't really believe, but I believe now. <laughs> yeah. So, and I mean, I just, I just love that because it was so wild for me that she was using all of these New Orleans, you know, everything grows in New Orleans, but like all this stuff that was constantly around me that I no longer recognize that my ancestors probably have. So to also, you know, thinking about as a memory project to like reactivate those kinds of knowledges that existed and that so many of uh, people are requesting medicinal plants and herbs so like to do a literal kind of healing you know it's so it's spiritual it's it's physical it's mental all, like all of those things seem so um, important and, and powerful to me yeah yeah and there I mean they've been connecting that work at Solitary Gardens to you know, the foraging, um, the foraging kind of phenomenon that's happening of people being like, yes, what are the plants that just grow here in the park that we don't even have to, that, and that have been growing here, yarrow, elderberry, these kinds of things, and then gathering them to make plant medicine out of them. And yeah, that are prolific. Yeah. Um, and th that kind of disconnection from plant knowledge, plant medicine, and all of that is, um, it's such a, a ubiquitous sort of result of colonial structures and just what's happened with 
um, with Western medicine. So yeah, it all feels very empowering on so many levels to be like, yes, what is growing in my yard right now that I actually, with right. some help of not too many people, um, figure out how to use that in ways that are beneficial to me and others. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking. Like, there's a weed in my backyard that's called Biden that's just everywhere in New Orleans. It's got these little sticky things that stick to your clothes and it's just, it is prolific. And we just thought it was a nuisance. You know, it's kind of feels like sticky on you. Um, and then somebody was like, no, Biden is good for inflammation, all this other stuff and people making like tinctures out of it and just being like, oh, <laughs> I need to think about this weed that's taken over my backyard in a different right. way, um, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned uh, a lot of things that are, you know, interesting about our work. We're showing these slides of sites that actually there's some sort of physical structure, but so much of our work, I feel like we're doing the the real ghost tour of New Orleans because even though there's this pr preservationist ethic in the city, so many of the the stories that we want to tell, those sites and stories haven't been preserved. So, also trying to figure out ways to tell stories when there's nothing in the landscape at all remaining that you know is related to that history when. You know, like in the case of the Claiborne overpass, the whole neighborhood has been gone. Street names have been changed. There's really no trace in the landscape. This, um, I'll just mention briefly, was a, a Chinese um, society that erected this tomb, which was a temporary burial site initially for um, Chinese immigrants who had come to Louisiana, recruited, um, initially after the end of slavery to replace enslaved laborers in Louisiana plantations recruited from places like um, Cuba and Hong Kong. And so some did come to Southern Louisiana, but they did not, you know, they were working on a contract system and they had options. So many left to go to California to work on railroads. Um, with the end of the Chinese Exclusion Act, it was a small population in Louisiana because of the Chinese Exclusion Act that people couldn't um, bring their families. Once they could, with the repeal of that act in like 1943, um, many went to larger cities. So some did um, go to New Orleans and, and start um, a small, or a couple of different Chinatowns that were mostly small businesses and were in neighborhoods that were, you know, integrated and, you know, had customers in black neighborhoods, for instance, restaurants and dry cleaning services. But um, this tomb then became a, a permanent burial site. It's it's not a traditional Chinese tomb. It's in the style of a regular New Orleans society tomb, but there are Chinese inscriptions and there's an altar inside where people um, could burn incense and make offerings. So this um, society tomb is in Cypress Grove Cemetery in New Orleans and also part of a a curated tour that we're including in the book on the forgotten dead. So, you know, cemetery tours, that's kind of part of the, the normal tourist thing, but the places that we are highlighting are often the, the, the sites and cemeteries that aren't part of the, the um, tourist trail and the, the people that that lived in those areas. And often again, some of those cemeteries where graves are not marked at all um, that, that we are highlighting and trying to memorialize those lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, this was another kind of thinking about actually the impact of Claiborne Avenue, um, <laughs> come circling back to, the, the slide at the beginning that gave you the image under the overpass of the uh, 
I, I, I 10 highway, um, 10, uh, interstate 10 that goes through the city, um, because offer one records was located on Claiborne Avenue, right. And that sort of thriving, um, black business corridor and was, a a black led black run, um, recording company and business that was a collective of black musicians that started in the early 1960s by Harold Baptiste and um, a handful of other musicians that he played with regularly who were just pretty fed up with the fact that black musicians were not being able to, able to make money off the royalties for music and um, hit songs that they played on and the union at the time was offering them a kind of a flat rate for sessions that they would do, but then that it didn't offer them anything past that. So they were kind of guaranteed a wage for the session. And so they didn't really see that as sufficient in terms of actual um, payment. <laughs> they were like, this is not, this is not actually enough for what we're doing for our contributions. This is not justice for us. And so started this offer one records as a way to keep the that the royalties all the recording rights all of that in the hands of the musicians themselves but I was just thinking about that aspect of precarity too because it just it was very difficult for them to maintain they they needed to like pump out hits basically and they did pump out um a couple of hits in those early 60s but then when the hits trailed off, they weren't really able to make it a successful go at it um, with running this record label. And so most of the musicians who are working for AFO and who are running AFO, like Harold Patisse, moved to Los Angeles where they were able to get work that you know could give them a, a more kind of stable wage. And so many of those musicians then stayed in LA and that they left New Orleans. And I think of that as just like such a story of New Orleans, people not being able to like make a living here, be treated with dignity and respect, live, uh, you know, without fear of violence to themselves and their children at the hands of <laughs> police, random white people, whoever, um, and just needing to leave um, to make a go of it somewhere else. And so that's, that to me is part of the the, the infrastructural precarity that is built on the colonial white supremacists and heteropatriarchal, heteropatriarchal foundations of the city. And there's also the story of like then people returning home um, when they're able to for various reasons. So Harold Batiste moves back to New Orleans a few decades later and helps fund or found rather the jazz program at the University of New Orleans where I teach, which is now a very successful music program. And he becomes, you know, basically like is able to kind of step back into a leadership role, which I don't think he ever like fully discontinued. And that's true for so many people like you, Linnell, you know, who are maintaining a relationship <laughs> in the city, even mm -hmm. while being in a state of potentially what we might consider kind of a permanent displacement. Mm -hmm. um, so, but. Which but of course was them. exacerbated <laughs> after Katrina. Yeah. You know, yeah. that really. Um accelerated that for for people even people who might have wanted to return but couldn't yeah. yeah but I think of AFO also as this such a model for what people can do like working collectively working cooperatively even if it only lasts for a few years that's significant and it's not something people associate with New Orleans they associate New Orleans with music and with the like jazz and R&B and all of that that was defining global sounds um, still does um, define global musical sounds internationally, and but people don't think about the you know the way in which New Orleans has been um, has created models of the business of doing those things um, mm -hmm. and this labor organizing. It's you know New Orleans is not treated as a place that should be considered as a model for labor organizing, but you know what I've learned in the researching of this book and teaching New Orleans literature and New Orleans public history is just that there are so many what have to be understood, I think, is deliberately forgotten, deliberately erased um, histories of, of labor organizing um, uh, in various communities that have, but, you know, thinking about a Black radical tradition in particular, um, that people like Claude Woods have really highlighted as kind of the, a node 
that then goes out and through the music itself, like thinking about musicians themselves just through playing music as activists, um, but then these other ways in which musicians organizing together to have rights to their music, to, to maintain control over their, their creative process, all of that um, as being such a key um, inspirational force. Again, even if it doesn't get the sort of like long-term press that it ought to, <laughs> um, we're thinking, I'm hoping our book might like lead to that and is a part of other projects that are doing that kind of amplification of histories that have been forgotten or erased. Um, but nonetheless, even if it didn't get like the like the big airtime, it should have gotten the big spotlight. You know that these nodes, like Harold Baptiste and his group, goes to LA. They're bringing all of that knowledge and insight to somewhere else. It just continues to have these kind of cross permutations that always have exceeded the local. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up Clyde Woods. I was actually thinking about him. You know, we're so indebted to him and his blues epistemology. I was thinking about it too when we were talking about the herbal medicine and the different ways of knowing and making sense that, you know, have been discounted and disregarded. I, I was thinking too about um, this musical tradition when you're talking about we don't think about the, the labor in New Orleans. And I think, you know, this the tourist industry and the the touristification of the city really perpetuates that. Like it's the greatest free show on earth. This idea that musicians are just like out on the street playing for free and and you know just happy to do that. I think feeds into this idea that people are yes they are on the street and people do play for free and in, in terms of transmitting the the culture. But people also hustle. Like New Orleans, you know, we might not want to work hard for other people, but everybody has a hustle. So well, people, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. the, yeah. it's always like, what's your side hustle? And what's the side hustle of your side hustle? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I mean, that's another talking about precarity how else can you figure out a way to to live in this uh, impossible place like you you need to do that if you you know now speaking of the tourist industry how can you really make a living doing that being underpaid as a service worker that can you don't even know you know that work might not be stable depending on what's going on you could be laid off at any time so like there's always some sort of way you constantly have to figure out what else can you do to support yourself and your family and your yeah. loved ones during the recent um mardi gras parades i was at a walking parade and there were two people who were selling um who had their ice chest their you know their coolers and were selling drinks it was like 9 p.m on a Friday night in the French Quarter. And they were exchanging information about where the, basically where the cops were um, because they were have one of them had already been um, shut down by somebody who was um, enforcing, now I'm trying to remember what the acronym was, um, but was it re enforcing sort of the, the alcohol, you know, kind of laws that you can't just like sell because they were selling beer, they were selling water um, out of their coolers. And they were like, so-and-so got raided over here on such and such a street, you know, um, but so-and-so had figured out a corner where they weren't getting bothered by cops. And they were two people who were presumably each other's competition technically, <laughs> because they're both trying to make, you know, a few dollars selling beer out of a cooler to some people at parades who don't want to go into a bar right now because they're enjoying themselves at the parade. And that's, that's, I feel like such a side hustle in New Orleans and has been, is just the kind of the parade side economies that are mm -hmm. um, part of what make people love parades. And this, you can, you know, access um, what you need just right there on the street corner. You don't have to go inside. Right. Um, but I just really appreciated them. Like I was shocked, A of all, I don't know why I was naive. But, you know, it was like nine o'clock on a Friday. And I'm like, they've got federal agents out here um, shutting people down for making 
however much I would think on a good night, they're probably making a few hundred dollars. Like this is what we're spending people's you know, time doing, policing this. Um, but I also appreciated that they were sharing intel with each other um, about how to survive it. And that's the way in which I feel like these also the, the sort of hustle economies of New Orleans are anti-capitalist <laughs> in so many ways. They're like, so even as they are making their money, but they're not operating um in the same ways that you know that people traditionally do which is to treat somebody like sort of like well it's, if you get the dollar I don't get the dollar you know um mm -hmm. kind of thing like we have to kind of stick together and have a network of how right. this works in order like to maroon sustain. economies yeah right. um yeah well I've I also made some purchases from some young women high school <laughs> students on the parade route uh -huh. this must have been like Sunday night uh, before <laughs> Mardi Gras, maybe Monday. Now I did tell the young, I wanted to, I did tell her I appreciate her hustle, but she was selling a range of things, but she had some pralines and she was selling pralines for $5. And wow. then, and she pulled out a praline. I said, nah. How big were they? Not big enough for $5. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so bad that first when she pulled out, I had to say, I was like, you know, I like your hustle, but you, I can't, I can't pay five dollars for this. And then she dug in and got me a bigger one. So I said, you might need some help with this business model <laughs> because you can't have different size pralines each for the same price. Some, but, but anyway, did she take them out? Or did no, you have any cash? cash. Right. I mean, she's high school student, so she's learning. Well, she's, what, what cash do people have in their wallet? They might have a one dollar. They might have a five dollar. So maybe she's like, just just get for five. No, because she had other things, uh, different prices. Oh, OK, OK. And I didn't even ask about Venmo. She might be doing all of that. I'm just old. So I had five dollars. <laughs> Hope they're doing well. I, <laughs> I did appreciate that they were walk. I mean, it probably was a school. No, I guess there was no school at that point. But they were work, you know. They they were working. Well, now um, we don't have that much time left. <laughs> so, well, so, speaking know, of... Maybe cruise through a couple of other things. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this, because we'll... Speaking of women, this site that we're doing is just talking about women who were entrepreneurs. Many of these women were entrepreneurs and women of color who were also voodoo priestesses and queens. And the police started raiding them in the 1850s. They were out in this remote location because they were dancing. They were integrated groups. Women gathered together. They were naked oftentimes. So they were raiding them for you know, doing things they uh, weren't supposed to do. But these women also like fought back and got together, even when they went to court, like women speaking different languages were outside the court protesting. So again, drawing on, on this history of like clandestine, um, in, in this case, like spiritual work, a lot of female God imagery, female em empowerment, uh, in the city. Yeah, and this is another example where there is some signage there, but it's some signage that tells you the very colonial version of this place that doesn't tell you this, uh, these other ways in which the space has been um, used by people. And that, of course, this was an indigenous settlement um, in the pre before the colonizers arrived. This was part of the, um, the indigenous tribes used this area um, for seasonal settlements right along Lake Pontchartrain. Um, and that's, it's also just feels like this is in the genealogy of the Maroon, um, the Maroon spirit um, of various communities and Maroon practices of various communities um, in and around the city. Um, yeah, I'm thinking also in our guidebook about how to take very familiar figures such as Louis Armstrong, who has been celebrated as kind of beloved son of the city, but to think about the fact that he, for um, for decades in the height of segregation was would not play in New Orleans because his band was an integrated band. And so he was like, even though they would have made exceptions for him, um, he just refused to, to bow down to it. And so as principal stopped playing in New Orleans and um, 
So there's various ways in which Louis Armstrong is remembered as this kind of beloved son of the city, but in so many ways, he was at odds with the people who ran the city um, during his lifetime and the kind of uh, white supremacist segregationist culture that was defining the city and that was married did maybe making it very difficult for musicians at various points in their careers to really make a living there so his was a uh, he's he's known as somebody who is kind of this I feel like he's treated as sort of this feel-good guy you know who sort of brought everybody together from all walks of life and it's not really his his history as somebody who protested these kinds of practices is just not remembered. So one of the things we're doing in our guide is to to think about the the whitewashing, frankly, of somebody like Louis Armstrong, who's um, his own kind of vocal protests against the racist practices of New Orleans were were part of his business model. Um, right. And also why he ends up, you know, making places like Chicago a, a long term home rather than New Orleans. Right. Queens, New York, right? Yeah. yeah right. And the fact that like the tour is cap capitalization on these figures that then become adopted as New Orleans heroes to sell the very city that was so inhospitable to them. Yeah. So we were thinking about our citations for just the people's guide in general and wanting to just give a shout out to the other members of our advisory board we already mentioned. Leon Waters, but there's just, just a, a, a another group of folks who we've been working with to help give us guidance and to hold us accountable and to help us complicate and broaden our conversations throughout and who have all written for the guide in various ways. So Louisa Dantas, who's an award-winning film, award filmmaker, highly recommend her documentary Land of Opportunity. Um, Sharice Harrison Nelson, who is a member of Guardians of the, oops, um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Oops, sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, it's Guardians of the Flame, um, Cultural Arts Society is herself a masking Mardi Gras Indian and is always making beautiful things and teaching people. Um, and Amy Lessened, who um, works at a kind of very, a variety of intersections and who writ has written for us about the water infrastructure of the city of New Orleans and the kind of ways in which water infrastructure and envir environmental racism and um, class hierarchies have worked together. Um, Catherine Mickna, who has who did a, a lot of work on the Free Southern Theater, has written for us about the Free Southern Theater and the 1960s and 70s Black Arts Movement radical practices. Oops. I don't know if you want to say, then do you want to introduce these other folks or no? Well, Molly Mitchell, who's been um, tremendously important, also has a project on, well, one of the, the projects we collaborate with, New Orleans Historical, that is a similar a digital site of um, entries around the, the city um, and has done work on slave advertisements, uh, a digital database. She's at the New Orleans Center. What's it called? New Orleans Studies. This, Midlow. Um, the Midlow, the Midlow Center. Center for New Orleans Studies at UNO. Frank Perez, who's uh, written about a lot of sites covering gay history in New Orleans, a tour guide. Kim Vazdeville, an academic at Xavier University and an administrator, but also probably much more famous for her work on baby dolls, her research on it, but not, and her practitioner, and she's done, and curated some, some museums on, on that tradition, right? And we mentioned Leon Waters' um, Hidden History Tours and also African-American um, History Museum, a grassroots museum. And then we want to just give a shout out to some of the digital platforms that we've been and not and also print media, <laughs> in some cases, platforms that we've been partnering with and who we see ourselves in a kind of a solidarity with in terms of their projects. So New Orleans Historical, which Linnell already mentioned, that's run in part by Molly Mitchell, Closter Wagnola, which focuses on the musical history. Um, Jordan Hirsch is the um, person we've partnered with from that project. Um, 
various people who have been participating in the 64 parishes, which is a kind of an, uh, an encyclopedic um, digital project on the history of Louisiana overall, but um, people like Kim Basville have written about baby dolls for 64 parishes and for us. Um, Paper Monuments is a project that's a counter memory that was about proposing paper monument alternatives to the white supremacist Confederate monuments that have for so long peppered the lot dotted the landscape of the city. And so thinking about posters as a way to have maybe temporal, temporary, more ephemeral um, monuments that were re re reflective of a people's history. And so um, Linella both wrote pa papers for their posters rather for the Paper Monuments Project. Um, and then we've also had contributors from Creole Gen, org, um, which focuses on the Creole and Afro-Creole um, history of the city in particular. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Leon's Hidden Hi History Tours. And there's there, are, I think that we're seeing like a, a burgeoning group of tours in the city run by individuals, but also by groups that are trying to speak to the history of grassroots organizing in town about what we think of as a people's history or history from below that does not just reinforce these exceptional, um, sanitized, mythological, frankly, um, mythical um, and mythological um, versions of the city that um, sort of promote um, either a kind of a sensationalized image of the city or one that's easily consumable um, for tourists. There's there's a kind of counter movement, I'd say, happening amongst the walking tours in the city in particular, um, but, but hard to say that, you know, I don't know, I just see Mr. Leon's Hidden History Project as so pivotal, pivotal as a model for people who are now doing things in that spirit. Um, in this last decade or so. Anything else you want to add about any of that, Linnell? Um, No, I, just, I guess, much more attention to the indigenous history and, yeah. and you know, prehistory of the city. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we even deliberated a lot about what to call the guide, the people's guide to New Orleans, but to think about Bobancha as the site that existed before it became New Orleans and that New Orleans is responsible to or indebted to because it was in, indigenous guides that even showed Bienville some of these uh, pathways that they used to navigate between the Mississippi River to all these bayous and trinasses to the to the lake and were already trading and and you know living in the in this region yeah Probably so much we, more sustainably yeah. than than we are. Yeah, yeah, that's something I was thinking about when we were thinking about the sort of like you know what's much discussed about the sort of impossibility of of living in New Orleans in the way that people live in New Orleans today, and just thinking about how differently um, Indigenous people live in this area because of course people have been living here um, for thousands and thousands of years, um, at least two thousand plus years, and thinking about the ways that Indigenous settlements used shell mounds to create um, safety places from floods and that they were migrating in and out and that they were moving in relation to the water and creating built environments that sustained them, but that were um, permeable and, and could live with water. Because um, obviously that's so much of what we're navigating here is living with and in relation to water. So, you know, just kind of that reminder that the impossibility of so much of this is due to the particular kinds of like colonial infrastructure that have been imposed upon a place that was um, was never inhabited in these ways um, for the thousands of years that preceded um, colonization. And yeah, so I want to shout out Jeffrey Derensburg and his project, Bulbancha is Still a Place, which um, has been produced as a zine project. They've had a couple of different issues of that zine. I think they're working on a new website but Bilbancha is still a place and there've been Bilbancha walking tours. Um, there, there are indigenous queer led um, tours um, by people like this particular um, indigenous person I know in the area, Lola Jean, who's running indigenous queer tours. If anybody's interested in any of that, please feel free to reach out to me or Linnell if you want suggestions about um, some of these lesser known tours that are happening right now. Um, it's very exciting and is 
you know, in some cases still very small scale. Um, and, you know, people who don't have a ton of infrastructure to build a whole like brand marketing <laughs> um, thing, you know, and they're not running bus tours, um, but are doing kind of small scale walking tours, in some cases, sliding scale, in some cases doing it as labor of love for free. Um, so all of that is happening and I'm very grateful for it. Um, okay. And then also just wanted to shout out um, in, in memoriam, people like Brandon Montrell, whose project he began on Instagram. I think it started on Instagram. I know it going viral. Of course, it could have had TikTok origin, actually, now that I think about it. Not entirely sure which one he started on, but he is, um, his Instagram was a viral source of just what he called hood history, um, telling the story of primarily places of just significance for Black communities in New Orleans and talking about the kind of different layers of that place um, over time. And he's a comedian. Um, and so the, the, the stories that he was telling were both informative and funny. Um, he often began his videos by saying, I'm going to stress y'all out. Let me stress y'all out. <laughs> so knowing that he was about to tell people perhaps a story that would be violent, that would that would stress them out to hear about it, but feeling like it was important to know it nonetheless. Um, and that sort of being stressed out, but knowing the history is better than not being stressed out. But that was also kind of his um, way of coming at it, um, way of just acknowledging right off the bat, this might be hard to hear. Um, but he was beloved um, and was very tragically um shot over the um and murdered over the recent um Christmas holidays in at the end of 2022 in a shooting that by all accounts he was not um intended for him he was not the intended target um and yet was kind of caught in the crossfire um of a shooting that was happening in the a grocery store parking lot here in the central business district of the city which is not considered historically a place where people expect a lot of gun violence. Um, and so just so much about this, um, there's just been a lot of public outcry about how this, how his death relates to this larger phenomenon of gun violence in the city and people, um, particularly Black New Orleanians being subject to violence and um, just tragic early deaths. So wanted to just think about him as an example of both possibility, thinking about so many of the kind of counter histories that he was telling as key to, you know, ways in which people can use social media to, to intervene, um, frankly, and, and, you know, kind of what's known and also to like to to fight against the kind of erasure, like thinking about the um, housing projects, which have been rebranded and reconstructed in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and him being like, I'm gonna return to the Melpomene um, to tell you a story about um, how people still remember, like people who are alive today still remember like what life was like in these places and you know what the sort of like vast wealth of culture that came out of those places. Um, and then of course, just the precarity of thinking about how a person like him then becomes um, another victim um, of what we see as this kind of ongoing um, situation in New Orleans and of course uh, in many cities in the US. So yeah, um, just wanted to kind of, I guess, take a moment to to remember him, to like, and to cite the contributions of someone like him, who you know, he's it's it's DIY history. Um, you know, he's that I don't know if a book would ever be published of like what he wrote about it, but uh, people are still going back to his Instagram page and, and writing comments and saying we miss you, and I wish you were here to like stress me out today and tell me something I didn't know before. Um, so I think you know, like a lot of what we're trying to do in this guide is to just honor the memory of people who in an ongoing way have made so many different kinds of contributions and experienced needless violence. Um, okay, and then finally, we wanted to kind of just reflect on the Mardi Gras experience that we just had with Linnell um, visiting New Orleans for Mardi Gras um, and maybe just give a couple of shout outs to some of the things that um, we experiences we had that are also part of our the people's guide um, in various ways. So 
on Mardi Gras Day, witnessing the Mardi Gras Indians debut, a whole group of Indians debuting from the Backstreet Cultural Museum, which is a site in the People's Guide that now has a new location because the daughter um, of Sylvester Francis, who started the Backstreet Museum, had to relocate, but was able to, through a lot of crowdfunding, I think in part, open up a new space, continuing the legacy of her father. The Margaret Indians are using this new space as a place to get dressed, to get suited up, to come out, to debut their suits on Mardi Gras Day, along with the baby dolls. Another masking tradition that is part of New Orleans public street performance and ritual that, again, is highlighted by contributors and advisory board members like Kim Bias DeVille in our guide and just thinking about the fact that these are there's that this is a this is living this is living legacy these are genealogies they're continuing to adapt and to innovate all of this is alive um right. and, and you know baby dolls that looking at the that history at least of uh women who were often sex workers in the city and came out on Mardi Gras, this uh, another kind of empowerment. I know was continuing to look at some of those traditions with one of our tours and the the guy. What's the name of it? Sex, sex and power. Sex and power. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, is it pleasure and power? Pleasure and power. Pleasure and power. <laughs> That's right. You know, I like it in alliteration. Yeah. Um, um, I went to Zulu uh, this past year. I don't ne necessarily like to always admit that out loud, but it was good going um, uptown to see that parade and looking at Zulu in a place that really was a black space, not on the same parade route or part of the parade route as um, Rex. So um, that was just a you know, good experience watching the parade with my aunt getting a lot of um, more coconuts than I've ever <laughs> gotten before in all of our Zulu history. Um, it, which even the, you know, the day before when I got one from the Uber driver. So we had quite a few uh, New Orleans moments, I think this past Mardi Gras. Um, I wanna just, maybe we can wrap up by thinking about like what provocations and questions we wanna leave on today. Uh, one thought I had was just how do you know when when something is finished <laughs> like we've been talking about legacy work and things being adapted over time and sort of like culture cultural traditions that um, that are maintained year after year after year with so much labor so much tedium and so much organizing um, that has to happen so how are we going to know when we're done with this project um, and our this at least this iteration um, of the the book project of the People's Guide to New Orleans. That's my provocation for us. Uh, well, that made me think about watching you this past carnival season work on your costume <laughs> with a lot of, you know, challenges along the way. And yet you went out on Mardi Gras looking really good. You know, sometimes it's just that deadline, like carnival was happening. So yeah. it might not have been what you envisioned, you know, because I was thinking in terms of provocation, that question that um, you asked about Jackie, you know, that for the Solitary Gardens, people thinking about what their dream um, house would be. And, I, you know, I'm trying to think about like what would our dream New Orleans would be or if you think mm -hmm. about your question, what would our dream project be? And that's not going to be the I think that's the thing that inspires us and motivates us. But that is not what we're going to produce <laughs> in this iteration. So um, we may not get the pool with the Black Panther at the bottom. Right. Not but, not yet. But we may get a really cool <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. well Jackie has a pool maybe we could have some it's version small. of that in her small <laughs> above ground pool yeah yeah that makes sense to me um yeah. well I appreciate that I definitely I feel like there is something with uh with just yeah respecting respecting a season 
And um, part of that for me, like thinking about Carnival is just being like, okay, yeah, you can have your, you know, your big ambitions about some beautiful art you're going to make. And sometimes it just needs to be, it's good enough because this is, we have all decided this is our ritual time. This is the time, this is the season for this. And if you put it off too long, it's a whole nother season. So kind of trying to like, you know, uh, honor our season <laughs> for producing this work and knowing that there are other seasons to come, not to be too hokey about it, but you know, that there can be other versions of that. So look forward to the Linnell and Stevie led People's Guide History of New Orleans Tours, perhaps debuting in 2024. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We have to get the book done, but then who knows what we're out here. And we could be doing tours and I don't know, what do we want? Some tricycles, like um, pedicabs, you know, like what, how do we want, we don't have to just be doing it the same old way, you know, we can innovate. We have some shade structures. Right. In costume. More accessible for people, costumes. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Well, I'm, I'm happy to do anything with you, Stevie. Always oh. a pleasure. Thank Good to see you. I haven't laid yeah. eyes on you since Mardi Gras. I know. I feel like I look not as exciting right now, but you know, <laughs> not quite. But... Less glittery, less glittery for sure. Um, well, it's been so good as always to talk to you, Linnell, and thanks for everyone who's listened or watched. To, um, thanks for sticking around for us. And um, we're excited to bring the People's Guide into the world for people to use as hopefully a tool and a jumping off place because we know it can't be totalizing and never will be, but as a jump off, hopefully a, an inspiring jump off. And thanks to all the people we've been working with on this project too. Um, all right. It's all right. Now it's time for us to jump off. It's Bourbon Street at midnight on Mardi Gras day and it's shutting down and right. you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That's right. <laughs> all right. They're sweeping the streets on us. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>